reflected sun material that they shone with a brilliant light and emitted enormous volumes of heat. They were, in reality, secondary suns for a short period after their formation as separate space bodies. These two largest of the solar system planets have remained largely gaseous to this day, not even yet having cooled to the point of complete condensation or solidification. The gas contraction nucleuses of the other ten planets soon reached the stage of solidification and so began to draw to themselves increasing quantities of the meteoric matter circulating in nearby space. The worlds of the solar system thus had a double origin, nucleuses of gas condensation, later on augmented by the capture of enormous quantities of meteors. Indeed, they still continue to capture meteors, but in greatly lessened numbers. The planets do not swing around the sun in the equatorial plane of their solar mother, which they would do if they had been thrown off by solar revolution. Rather, they travel in the plane of the Angona solar extrusion, which existed at a considerable angle to the plane of the sun's equator. While Angona was unable to capture any of the solar mass, your sun did add to its metamorphosing planetary family some of the circulating space material of the visiting system. Due to the intense gravity field of Angona, its tributary planetary family pursued orbits of considerable distance from the dark giant, and shortly after the extrusion of the solar system ancestral mass, and while Angona was yet in the vicinity of the sun, three of the major planets of the Angona system swung so near to the massive solar system ancestor that its gravitational pull, augmented by that of the Sun, was sufficient to overbalance the gravity grasp of Angona and to permanently detach these three tributaries of the celestial wanderer. All of the solar system material derived from the Sun was originally endowed with a homogeneous direction of orbital swing, and had it not been for the intrusion of these three foreign space bodies, all solar system material would still maintain the same direction of orbital movement. As it was, the impact of the three Angona tributaries injected new and foreign directional forces into the emerging solar system with the resultant appearance of retrograde motion. Retrograde motion in any astronomic system is always accidental and always appears as a result of the collisional impact of foreign space bodies. Such collisions may not always produce retrograde motion, but no retrograde ever appears except in a system containing masses which have diverse origins. 6. The Solar System Stage, the Planet Forming Era Subsequent to the birth of the solar system, a period of diminishing solar disgorgement ensued. Decreasingly, for another 500,000 years, the Sun continued to pour forth diminishing volumes of matter into surrounding space. But during these early times of erratic orbits, when the surrounding bodies made their nearest approach to the sun, the solar parent was able to recapture a large portion of this meteoric material. The planets nearest the sun were the first to have their revolutions slowed down by tidal friction. Such gravitational influences also contribute to the stabilization of planetary orbits while acting as a break on the rate of planetary axial revolution, causing a planet to revolve ever slower until axial revolution ceases, leaving one hemisphere of the planet always turned toward the sun or larger body, as is illustrated by the planet Mercury and by the moon, which always turns the same face toward Urantia. When the tidal frictions of the moon and the earth become equalized, the earth will always turn the same hemisphere toward the moon, and the day and the month will be analogous, in length about 47 days. When such stability of orbits is attained, tidal frictions will go into reverse action, no longer driving the moon farther away from the earth, but gradually drawing the satellite toward the planet. And then, in that far distant future, when the moon approaches to within about 11,000 miles of the earth, the gravity action of the latter will cause the moon to disrupt, and this tidal gravity explosion will shatter the moon into small particles, which may assemble about the world as rings of matter resembling those of Saturn, or may be gradually drawn into the Earth as meteors. If space bodies are similar in size and density, collisions may occur, 
But if two space bodies of similar density are relatively unequal in size, then if the smaller progressively approaches the larger, the disruption of the smaller body will occur when the radius of its orbit becomes less than two and one half times the radius of the larger body. Collisions among the giants of space are rare indeed, but these gravity tidal explosions of lesser bodies are quite common. Shooting stars occur in swarms because they are fragments of larger bodies of matter which have been disrupted by tidal gravity exerted by nearby and still larger space bodies. Saturn's rings are the fragments of a disrupted satellite. One of the moons of Jupiter is now approaching dangerously near the critical zone of tidal disruption and, within a few million years, will either be claimed by the planet or will undergo gravity tidal disruption. The fifth planet of the solar system of long, long ago traversed an irregular orbit, periodically making closer and closer approach to Jupiter until it entered the critical zone of gravity tidal disruption, was swiftly fragmentized, and became the present-day cluster of asteroids. Four billion years ago witnessed the organization of the Jupiter and Saturn systems, much as observed today except for their moons, which continued to increase in size for several billions of years. In fact, all of the planets and satellites of the solar system are still growing as the result of continued meteoric captures. Three billion five hundred million years ago, the condensation nucleuses of the other ten planets were well formed and the cores of most of the moons were intact, though some of the smaller satellites later united to make the present-day larger moons. This age may be regarded as the era of planetary assembly. Three billion years ago, the solar system was functioning much as it does today. Its members continued to grow in size as space meteors continued to pour in upon the planets and their satellites at a prodigious rate. About this time, your solar system was placed on the physical registry of Nebadon and given its name, Monmesha. Two billion five hundred million years ago, the planets had grown immensely in size. Urantia was a well-developed sphere about one-tenth its present mass and was still growing rapidly by meteoric accretion. All of this tremendous activity is a normal part of the making of an evolutionary world on the order of Urantia, and constitutes the astronomic preliminaries to the setting of the stage for the beginning of the physical evolution of such worlds of space, in preparation for the life adventures of time. 7. The Meteoric Era, the Volcanic Age, the Primitive Planetary Atmosphere Throughout these early times, the space regions of the solar system were swarming with small disruptive and condensation bodies, and in the absence of a protective combustion atmosphere, such space bodies crashed directly on the surface of Urantia. These incessant impacts kept the surface of the planet more or less heated, and this, together with the increased action of gravity as the sphere grew larger, began to set in operation those influences which gradually caused the heavier elements, such as iron, to settle more and more toward the center of the planet. Two billion years ago, the Earth began decidedly to gain on the moon. Always had the planet been larger than its satellite, but there was not so much difference in size until about this time, when enormous space bodies were captured by the Earth. Urantia was then about one-fifth its present size, and had become large enough to hold the primitive atmosphere which had begun to appear as a result of the internal elemental contest between the heated interior and the cooling crust. Definite volcanic action dates from these times. The internal heat of the Earth continued to be augmented by the deeper and deeper burial of the radioactive or heavier elements brought in from space by the meteors. The study of these radioactive elements will reveal that Urantia is more than one billion years old on its surface. The radium clock is your most reliable timepiece for making scientific estimates of the age of the planet, but all such estimates are too short because the radioactive materials open to your scrutiny are all derived from the Earth's surface and hence represent Urantia's comparatively recent acquirements of these elements. One billion five hundred million years ago, the Earth was two-thirds its present size, while the Moon was nearing its present mass. Earth's rapid gain over the moon in size enabled it to begin the slow robbery of the little atmosphere which its satellite originally had. 
Volcanic action is now at its height. The whole earth is a veritable fiery inferno, the surface resembling its earlier molten state before the heavier metals gravitated toward the center. This is the volcanic.